Oh, well, all of my timepieces indicate that it's now 3.40, so let's make a start. Um, today and Tuesday, and then the following week, we'll continue the same idea. We should look at the political changes and developments in Britain and afterwards in Ireland during what we might call the post-Roman and pre-Viking periods. So roughly we're talking about maybe somewhere towards the end of the 5th century and while taking ourselves perhaps up to second half of the 8th century. Now obviously that's a, a long period of time that we're covering so we won't go into a lot of detail but there will be some of the traditional kind of names and dates kind of history. So this is more the kind of political version of what we were looking at to some extent before where we we're focusing on sort of demographics, population movement, ethnic divisions and so on. In addition we shall look at the development of Christianity amongst uh, the British, English, Irish peoples during this period. Primarily, I think, on Tuesday next week, we'll look at that. And uh, for that in particular, if you can read, have a read of the uh, link I've given at the bottom on the bibliography. So again, yes, ladies, you are not here on Tuesday, so I'll give you the bibliography. Um, which is some material from Bede's Ecclesiastical History that will give us some things to talk about in that context as well. Now, there are a number of issues, I think maybe we've mentioned some of these before, that we should talk about very, very generally at the start of this kind of a topic. And it relates not just to what's going on in Britain and Ireland, but that's why I've put up this map of uh, Western Europe and beyond, in a sense. Uh, the m first point is the issue of continuity. And by continuity, we can talk in terms of perceived continuity, and if this is something that historians can even determine, of course, but real, that's perhaps a rather strong way of putting it. But what I'm talking about here is that the peoples of Britain and by extension peoples living in other parts of the old Roman world in Western Europe uh, perceived to some extent that they were continuing Roman traditions. Okay, we've made this point before. And of course when we talk about Roman and we're talking about many hundreds of years of history before this period, of course, there isn't a single thing that we can say this is Roman or something. The Roman world was a changing and dynamic world as well. But certainly, people living in these areas perceived themselves as continuing Roman traditions in one way or another. When we look on the map, of course, we see a big change. If we'd had a kind of political map of uh, the Roman Empire a few hundred years before this, and that date is wrong, in fact, that's presumably something like 526, there must be, a, I don't know what, that's an error there, but uh, this is a sort of 6th century situation or something. But um, if we are able to look at this same area on a map from, say, the 3rd century, or we just say this is the Roman Empire, okay, going up to up here, as we've seen, and covering all these, we could break them into provinces, but it's all part politically of the Roman world under the Roman Emperor, or the Western Roman Emperor, or whatever, okay. But by the middle of the 6th uh, century, we see the breakdown politically of this area into a series of kingdoms, okay, ruled by men who take the title king in one way or another. Uh, and kind of beyond that, we see pseudo-kingdoms or tribal groupings and things like that that are uh, on the edges of this and so on. So, again, to make the same point, for Britain, we had our old map, we've seen this map before, okay, showing the... Uh, main administrative divisions of Roman Britain, but as a whole, okay, uh, we talk about Roman Britain, then we division into provinces, but it's part of the Roman world. 
up to the point of Hadrian's and briefly the Antonine Wall. By the post-Roman period, we see very similar to what we saw here in a sense, a series of separate and to some extent independent kingdoms emerging in Britain and also as we'll see next week, beginning next week, in more detail in Ireland. Okay. So today what we're going to look at is uh, the political map of here. But as I was saying before, despite this political discontinuity that we can clearly describe, the peoples of these kingdoms, in varying degrees and in varying ways, at least up to a point, perceived themselves as continuing in one way or another Roman traditions. We've mentioned Gildas before, the uh, 6th century uh, British uh, religious writer. Uh, he refers to the British people in a rather Roman way on more than one occasion. Okay, he clearly sees himself as part of a, an ongoing Romano-British or Roman tradition. We saw the Ogham Ohm inscription the other day of the guy who called himself or was called by his uh, pro, what am I, I'm like, not even right properly, his, uh, from South Wales, protector, okay, a Latin uh, word assuming some kind of idea of a, uh, of, uh, of a Romanized tradition of a ruler as protecting people or whatever. Uh, we look at some of the areas as well, I mean, the, what becomes the English Kingdom of Kent, okay, is and I may have mentioned this before, but the name itself, Kantiaki, Kent, okay, the English settlers setting up their kingdom in this area are taking over uh, a Roman and even pre-Roman kind of at least political idea. The same we see, okay, the Domnoni here becomes uh, uh, the kingdom of Domnonia, Devon. The Demetai down here becomes Daved in South Wales. These are, with some small philological changes, they are the same uh, words, the same names, and so on. So the way that um, people see themselves, the names they're using, and so on, up to a point, reflect some kind of perceived, and perhaps even up to a point, real continuity. Okay, there were groups of people living together who were more or less living together in the same way and continuing the same style of living as their predecessors had done for a long time and things like that. Okay. Historical sources, writings now, we tend to think in terms of periods, we draw lines and say this is a break here. Okay. Um, politically we can see big changes but behind that these people perceived a certain level of continuity and I think we should at least recognize that up to a point. Okay. And even what's going on in the kingdoms and what's happening there is more complicated than the historical sources led us to believe. So, for example, as we shall see later on, the kingdom of the West Saxons, Wessex as it becomes known, of course, uh, one of its founders is called Kerditch in the later sources, and this is probably just a version of the Welsh name Keredig, now with a G, okay, in modern Welsh, okay. So the West Saxons perhaps are talking about a settler coming in from the continent, they see him as a founder and founding and creating their kingdom, but in fact the original guy, if he existed at all, was probably some kind of a Br Briton called Coroticus or something like that, okay, but they've anglicized him and made it into a very English kingdom, whereas obviously what was going on was a great, was a lot more complicated. We saw from those maps last week how we saw uh, place names indicating English and Britons uh, living together or interacting and things like that, and we can see perhaps something similar going on here. So, continuity, discontinuity, there's no kind of black or white definite sort of thing, I think that's the main, that's the first point to make. Okay. Secondly, when studying the early history of these kingdoms, and we're talking about, again, during the very late 5th, 6th and 7th centuries and so on particularly, okay, we're dealing to some extent with what we've mentioned before, and 
Uzge mentioned in her presentation, uh, origin legends. Okay? The later occupants and rulers of these kingdoms, perhaps in the 8th century or later, they presenting to us, they are presenting to us the kind of official political version of their origin. Okay? Just as we saw there with this Keredig guy becoming Keredic, uh, becoming an Anglo-Saxon in effect or something. The same in other cases as well. And the very early accounts of these kingdoms are very difficult for us to understand because for the most part we don't have very many contemporary sources. We don't have sources which tell us about what's going on politically in most of these areas in the 6th century. We have Bede writing in the early part of the 8th century. Okay, We have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and some other annals dealing with a later period but reaching back into this period. One of the few sources which we can say vaguely is contemporaneous is Gildas and he doesn't give us a lot of detail as we've seen but we'll have a look today I hope if we've got time at some of the details he gives us about uh, Wales and perhaps uh, what is now Devon as well. What's going on is not as simple and straightforward as these uh, sources present. In the case of the English as we shall see they describe a man and his brother or a man and his son arriving and then that's the beginning of the kingdom. Okay? They begin to fight battles, they defeat the Welsh and then they begin to establish a kingdom over time and so on. There's a kind of repetitive pattern that we've mentioned before. And this is a quite a simplified origin legend. The truth is often more difficult to tell. We can use archaeological sources, onomastic sources and try and piece together what was going on. There were lots of people living throughout Britain uh, in the late and post-Roman period, okay, and when the Roman administration and Roman military support had gone, they basically had to defend themselves. Some of them were moving around, some of them were coming from outside of Britain and settling here, others were people whose ancestors had been living in Britain for a while. They were all faced with the same problem of how do we survive, we don't have a large-scale administrative and military infrastructure to support us. Things localise, Local groups of people live together slowly as perhaps culture and society kind of develop. We see uh, larger groupings, groupings coming together in larger confederations and these become perhaps these kingdoms and they're flexible, they are changing, they're not fixed borders. And again, maps like, maps like that are kind of misleading because the, we can't think of fixed legal borders in a kind of modern sense and certainly not for something like that as well. Okay, So we're talking about something very loose uh, and day-to-day -day basis and then primarily as certain military leaders, people who can uh, get lots of warriors to follow them, establish their own position, then they establish authority over other people and gradually they build up something which is a kind of proto-kingdom almost and then they emerge from there. So we've got a very, very dark period and how we can understand that, we can only go so far with the historical sources and the other sources may or may not help to build up uh, a picture from that. Okay, any questions? These are the sort of broad themes that I want us to kind of think about or whatever and uh, we'll explore these and some other themes while we go along in the uh, uh, looking at the individual kingdoms. We'll start today by looking at England which well, obviously from an Anglo perspective is the most important, it's the biggest and becomes the most dominant area and we'll look at Wales and perhaps today if we've got time we might say a bit about Scotland as well or we might leave that for next uh, or for Tuesday and then next week we'll look at do the same kind of thing for Ireland as well. Right, okay, so England here is a little diagram I prepared earlier um, but before we look at that, or parts of that, and that doesn't contain by any means all of the kings uh, whose names I wish to mention briefly today, but a few other things again as well. As I said, we're dealing with this period, we're going to look at some of these kingdoms like the Wessex, Kent, Kent Mercia, we won't say much about the East Saxons perhaps, or even the East Angles, Lindsay, and we'll say a bit about Northumbria as well, and the kingdoms of Bernicia, and Deira. And if at any point you can't read what's on here because of this system, if the name is not clear, some of them look a bit blurred to me but then I'm kind of close up, please say and I can write them up, okay? Because uh, I'm kind of assuming that this is clear and it may or may not be depending on your eyesight and so on.
So again, turning to origin legends first, just to reiterate what I just said, the uh, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in particular, which was compiled much later, as we said a few weeks ago, but the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle contains a series of accounts of the arrival during the 5th century, during the 400s, of dynastic founders, men who they believe are the uh, ancestor of the ruling family of one of these kingdoms. Okay? So we get guys for Kent, we get guys for Wessex as well, and we get Sussex, for example. Okay? And they all have a very similar pattern. As I said before, it's either a father and a son, or it's two brothers, okay? And usually their names alliterate. Alliteration means what? What does alliteration mean? To alliterate. Begin with the same letter or sound or something like that, yeah. So, for example, for Kent, that we'll look at in a moment, we have two brothers, Hengist and Horsa, both beginning with a, an H sound and the name connected to the word for horse, in fact. Okay. And for the West Saxons, we have Kerditch and his son, Kernerich. Okay, Again, both beginning with letter C. And that perhaps sounds a little bit suspicious, okay, that they're somehow repeating the same pattern of alliterating founders coming in and things like that. It seems to... Uh, too obvious and too clear to be uh, chance and things. So it's some kind of repetitive pattern that they're building up here. And again, as I said, what these documents are doing, what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is doing, is projecting back into the 5th and early 6th century uh, the idea of the kingdom. There probably wasn't uh, something like the West Saxon Kingdom in existence in any kind of very clear way at the end of the 5th century, but the Anglo-Saxon writers, the West Saxon writers who were putting it together later on or drawing on uh, sources before them, wanted to present this. So they talk about these early conquerors, they say someone dies and he takes the kingdom. There is a, an old English phrase, they even talk about the kingdom very early on, but we can't talk about that. So that's again the point that the sources are simplifying and imposing their reality of a kingdom back into the early period. And for a long, long time, historians followed that. And histor historical accounts of the early kingdoms of England more or less followed uh, what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said. And it's only more recently that scholars have realized that this is just kind of legendary stuff and what we can and cannot say uh, is not so simple. We can use archaeological evidence to look for the settlements of Anglo-Saxons in these areas, okay, trying to find burials that are of an Anglo-Saxon kind. And again, then we've got our old problem of interpreting archaeological evidence. If it's an Anglo-Saxon style series of burials, does that mean Anglo-Saxon people are buried there, or does it mean local British people are just adopting the style of burial that uh, the Anglo-Saxons have because they are dominant, um, but they're quite a small elite group or something like that. The fashion thing might be going on as well, and the pottery issues of whether it's trade or exchange or fashion and so on. There's a series of place names. I don't have a map for this, but um, we don't really need one. But there's a series of uh, place names which, until quite recently, uh, scholars believed were very, very early English names. They originally ended in the term Ingas, which means kind of people of, or uh, followers of, or family of someone, okay? So, for example, the modern English place name Reading, or Hastings, the famous Battle of Hastings, and there we even have the S added on, okay? The people of Radha, or something, and the followers or people or family of Hasta, or something like that, not Hasta as in Sikh in Turkish and Persian, but uh, a different thing. Uh, and we find a lot of these in the sort of southeastern areas of England, and scholars used to think that these kind of names, maybe they are the names of very early groups, tribal groups with a leader, Radha or Hast or something, who are settling in that area, building a village or town or set small settlement, I should say, okay, giving it their name, and then perhaps controlling 
a small area around there. And these are the things which eventually get kind of put together and form into later into sort of larger kingdoms and things. So we have small wandering groups of families or something like that. So you've got archaeological evidence, you can turn to place names that we said before. Okay. It's, uh, it's a very mixed thing. From the historical perspective, from the looking at our sources, really only in the later part, second half of the 6th century and into the 7th century, can we really begin to feel that the sources are telling us something reliable. This man existed, he did this, and so on. Okay. So for the earlier period, 5th into the 6th century, we're definitely in the area of legend. We can't really say very much at all, and most historians uh, would probably agree with that um, uh, conclusion. Another couple of concepts to mention before we go back to the map and my diagram. At some point in the Middle Ages, some historical writers began to think in terms of, for England, what, they, what we now call the heptarchy. Hept. Anyone know Greek? What the hept means? Hept element. S seven. Seven. That there were seven kind of big main kingdoms. This might derive, some people say it derives from Bede's account of the different ethnic groups that we read a couple of weeks ago. But, okay, we talk in terms of the seven kingdoms, the East Saxons, South Saxons, Kent, West Saxons, Mercia, uh, East Angles, and Northumbria. Okay, these are kingdoms which are called the Heptarchy. But beyond that, there were, at, in fact, that kind of is again simplifying things, because below that there were other kingdoms that didn't succeed and become significant later on, uh, Middle Angles, and in what becomes Mercia we see a, a series of peoples and pseudo-kingdoms like the Hwitcher and the Magoncita that become part of Mercia and lose their independence. And we have Lindsay up here and so on. So they, the pattern was far more complicated, but of course some won and expanded and some lost out. And this concept of the heptarchy uh, becomes quite well established. Bede himself talks about uh, um, certain kings ruling or having an imperium, kind of not quite an empire, a, a rule south of the Humber. And uh, he mentions a number of kings who were very powerful from one of the different kingdoms and established this. And again, this leads to another later concept which historians reject today, which is the idea of a title of Bretwalder. Some kings are said to have been the Bretwalder, the ruler of Britain, the Britain ruler that they were an Anglo-Saxon king that somehow established a great power over others and had this kind of title. And again, just as the heptarchy is to a large extent ignored, uh, apart from being a convenient concept, so the idea of Brett Wilder is, is debated by historians as well. But it, it's this idea that certain rulers exerted great influence south of the Humber uh, from one of these kingdoms, and they are therefore worth, worthy of note, or something like that. Okay. To go back here, we'll begin with Kent. Okay, we'll start with the kingdom of Kent. Kent, traditionally, again in the chronicles and so on, Bede traces its origin from Hengist and Horsa. Okay, and as we said, they are supposed to have arrived sometime shortly after 450, something like that. The date given is 449. It says, in that time, uh, Hengist and Horsa came. Then it describes a series of battles they fight against uh, British rulers and so on. What's going on in Kent is rather more uh, complicated. Um, Kentish Anglo-Saxons or Kentish English sometimes are regarded as Jutes. Remember, we talked about the Jutes as well as the Angles and the Saxons. But there's some evidence of various sorts to suggest that uh, Kent also had connections with what is now France, Francia, the Franks, okay, who were a Germanic people living in that area. So they had some connection, there may have even been some settlement by Franks 
in that region as well. We can begin to talk about historical aspects of Kent with the reign of Athelbert. And this letter, Ash, Anglo-Saxon letter, Ash, which is an A and an E put together, okay, usually pronounced A as a short A, but sometimes turned into an E. So you might see this name as Ethelbert as well, but we'll pronounce it Athelbert here. Okay. And his dates... Before him, we have a number of names and so on, but we can't really say that anything is really going on. He's the king, the first king that emerges from the sort of legendary darkness and so on. And he's important in a number of ways. Firstly, he was married to Bertha, who was daughter of Charibert, a Frankish king round Paris. Okay, so his wife was a French woman, or Frankish. She was not... English, and we just talked about evidence of connections between, perhaps quite naturally, between Kent and northern Francia before. Okay? And she was Christian. He was himself, like all the Anglo-Saxon early kings and settlers, was a pagan, but she was Christian. And it's during his reign that uh, Augustine's uh, mission to the English comes. We'll talk about that on uh, Tuesday next week, but he's the first king of the Kents, Kentish men to become Christian. Okay, so he's a very important figure in that respect, if not in others as well. Secondly, or in addition, probably near the beginning of the 7th century, middle of his reign somewhere, 602, 603, something like that, he issued law codes. Okay, perhaps under the influence of his Christian advisors from the continent, they said, why don't you write some things down, let's write your language down, Old English down, and Roman kings and rulers have laws, so let's put some of your laws down as well. So he actually uh, is an important source of early English, early Anglo-Saxon law. Okay, he issued laws, he's trying to rule like a king or whatever. And he's the first big guy, okay? He's the first big important person. And we can see some of the later kings here. His daughter becomes married into the Northumbrian ruling line. We'll talk about that later on. Shows the dynastic connections they have. By the second half of the 8th century, so by 750 onwards, the kingdom of Kent had become more and more under the influence of the Mercians, the expanding power of Mercia in the centre of England. And uh, I think by the end of the uh, 8th century, Kent had effectively kind of disappeared. Okay? So it's an early kingdom that doesn't survive uh, beyond uh, about 780, something like that. Okay, we'll turn westwards to look at the West Saxons next, the kingdom of the West Saxons which again has a legendary history and has probably something a little bit more complicated as well. Uh, keep the board up here, we don't need this one for the moment. There seems to have been a people living in the upper reaches of the River Thames called the Gewisse, okay, and they are probably the small population group that expands and eventually forms the basis of what becomes the kingdom of the West Saxons or Wessex. Officially, however, it is Kerditch and his son Kernerich arriving in, I check my dates, 495 and then fighting a series of battles against the uh, British or Welsh and then establishing uh, their kingdom according to the uh, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle but again as we said this is not something that we can rely on now okay and we can talk r rather about a number of peoples coming together and perhaps this Gwisa people forming the kind of focus or center of that it's in the 7th century, the 600s, that we can see 
uh, some more clear names and developments in uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, in West Saxon history. We have a couple of people to mention. A ruler called Cadwalla, who for a few years expanded the influence of West Saxons over Kent and elsewhere, okay, expanding the kingdom. He also converted to Christianity. And his name, interestingly enough, may also be some kind of Welsh name, Cadwallon, double L there is in modern Welsh. So just as his alleged ancestor, Cerdic, has a kind of Welsh name, so his name itself has some kind of Welsh significance, British significance. So uh, the West Saxon dynasty, definitely not sort of purely English in that sense. It has some kind of connection with British people. The kingdom that was emerging from the Gewissa and even continuing later on uh, had a broader uh, identity. The next big king following on from him is Ine as it's uh, pronounced, and he had further military success, expanding the kingdom, establishing his power. Okay. He also put down some law codes. He also redacted uh, Wessex, West Saxon laws, and uh, it's in his laws that we see the references to the Welsh slaves that I mentioned last time as well. Okay, what exactly uh, these people were is a bit obscure, but while meaning slaves. And some people suggest he also reorganized his developing kingdom, broke it up into administrative units, the, the earliest uh, things that will eventually become shires. Okay, England still today we talk about Hampshire, Yorkshire and so on. Well, the shires as a name and as a concept may have began perhaps with inner uh, in this region here. So an important ruler both militarily but administratively as well. Why is Wessex perhaps the most important Anglo-Saxon kingdom in the long run? Does anyone know? Why is it? It doesn't figure so much in Bede's history, for example, so maybe not so important in the beginning of the 8th century, but in the long run, Wessex is perhaps the most important English kingdom of this period. We'll talk about it in a few weeks' time. First British kingdom uh, No, there were others and so on. It wasn't the first. It's more to do with what happens later rather than what's happening now that I'm referring to, but that was a good guess. Um, when the Vikings come, I'm basically over a series of decades different combinations of Vikings, as we shall see soon, wipe out all of these kingdoms. Okay? They take over some, they destroy others, and so on. It's only, and again, by the skin of his teeth, King Alfred of the West Saxons survives that period and then comes to fight back and then eventually uh, re-establishes uh, his kingdom against the Vikings. And then his descendants, during the 10th century, they expand West Saxon power against the Scandinavian settlers and established the Kingdom of England, okay, as it becomes by the 11th century. So uh, Wessex becomes very important for us retrospectively because of the importance of these people later on. That's why, for example, it figures significantly in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle because it was the West Saxon kings who were uh, interested in, uh, who put this together in a sense. For our period, however, Perhaps more interesting and uh, to some extent more important, we'll turn to Northumbria and then we'll say a bit about Mercia as well. I'll try and squeeze in Northumbria before the break and then we might have time for Mercia afterwards. Northumbria as a whole develops quite late okay, compared to what's going on in the south uh, and it comprises, it's a mixture of two kingdoms originally, Bernicia and Deira. Bernicia, which is these guys primarily, and Deira, which is 
these guys this bit of the map here, but I haven't mentioned all their kings. I've just got a few names here to show some connections and so on. We see them perhaps emerging during the 6th century, but very early on, we don't see a lot of expansion. Okay? Venetia settled in this castle. I've been up to Bambra up here on a rock here, and they are further down south. The English settlers in these areas stuck pretty much on the coast, okay, being pushed back by um, British kingdoms in the north that aren't mentioned here, but we've got Godolphin here and Reged here and so on, pushing the, um, preventing the expansion of these kingdoms at the early stages. So they were just uh, a small group of settlers based in these areas, I think. The names of Deira and Benicia are even thought again to be of British origin, so it might be that small British or Welsh kingdoms were taken over by uh, some uh, tough Anglo-Saxon arrivals and then it becomes officially an English kingdom, but again probably a mixture ethnically and even politically perhaps. For Benicia, we begin with Ida up here and let's give his dates. I should say that historians do disagree about some dates here during this early period and some will say this happened in the following year, it all depends on how we understand the chronicles and so on. So uh, this is not uh, entirely, I wouldn't say these are perfectly accurate or whatever. Okay. And he is the earliest uh, sort of big ruler there and vaguely contemporary with him, just slightly later we have in Deira we have uh, Ale. It is, however, with this guy called Athelfrith, which is a very difficult name to pronounce when you've had a few drinks of beer, Athelfrith, um, that things kind of really get going, I think, okay, that really the expansion of what becomes Northumbria begins. Let's say we have for him Kierke. 592 to, of course, 616. He was able to push out his contemporary and brother-in-law, Edwin. This is the Anglo-Saxon name that becomes the modern name, Edwin. Okay. And he takes over both Deira as well as his Benicia. Okay, he establishes a kind of hegemony over both of them. It's the first big time that we see both of these kingdoms uh, under one ruler or something. However, in 616, Edwin is able to come back. He has help from the um, East Anglian king, Radwild, and they defeat Athelfrith and push him out. And Edwin establishes himself again both in Bernicia and in uh, Deira. He follows this pattern of trying to control both. He makes significant um, military expansion okay, of the kingdom as it's kind of becoming Northumbria at the moment, but it still isn't. And also he is married, he becomes married to Athelbert, who is the Christian daughter of Athelbert. Okay, from Kent that we mentioned before, and Edwin converts to Christianity, okay, and he's got this Christian wife, and we'll talk about that, I hope, again next week on Tuesday. So, again, we see this process of military expansion, but also the arrival of Christianity, often through these marriages, interestingly enough, okay, the connection, it gives a kind of push uh, towards these things. And it's under Edwin that we see the emergence or re-emergence of York as an important here uh, ecclesiastical centre, okay, bishop based at York because obviously he's a Christian ruler and he has a bishop and so on. In 633, however, Edwin is killed by an army led by Penda of Mercia and probably the king from Gwynedd in North Wales, okay, and they fight against him and they kill him, and for a while they take control or they dominate um, uh, what is now uh, Northumbria, and the two kingdoms get split up for a year or so. Then we arrive at the important figure of Oswald. <laughs> 
He is son of Athelfrif and had been in exile for a while in Dalriada, okay, and elsewhere. And uh, he uh, re-establishes his power over both the kingdoms as well and defeats the Mercians and re-establishes um, his power in the kingdom. He also extends his influence south of the Humber, so he's a very important figure in that sense. And he was eventually killed in 642, possibly in the town near the town now is called Oswald's Tree, which means Oswald's Tree, okay, on the Welsh borders here, fighting against the Mercians and the Welsh and so on. So during this period we see Northumbrian power resisting the Mercians and extending southwards as well for a while, okay, and that's very important. Eventually, again, things break down, but eventually we get the figure of Oswy, who was married to Edwin's uh, sister, so we have a kind of union again, as we've seen there, between the two houses. And it's under him that finally Northumbria, the two kingdoms are brought together, united, and more or less stay together uh, subsequently. Okay. And in 655, in a place called Winwide, which might be somewhere in Yorkshire near Leeds, as it is today, okay, he again defeats um, his rival from Dera, there was a rival there, Mercia and Wales, and establish his power. Okay? And that's the sort of final creation of Northumbria. We don't have a division now, and uh, the boundary of Northumbria extending this way uh, is more or less established. Northumbria continues as a kingdom until the Viking period, okay? and then in, I think it's 867, somewhere around about there, okay, the kingdom is more or less destroyed by Vikings who are coming in. Okay? Northumbria is very important because while being technically an English kingdom, okay, it's geographically further north and to some extent isolated, and during the early period, during the 6th and 7th centuries, uh, the Northumbrian kings, as well as interacting and fighting against the Mercians from the south, are having quite a lot to do with people in northern England and what is now Scotland, okay? And we see the emergence of a kind of northern English, Scottish or even Irish kind of cultural world with the creation of fine written uh, copies of the Bible and artistic styles and so on. And English scholars sometimes claim these to be of Northumbrian style and origin, whereas the Irish will claim, well, it's really the Irish influence on Northumbria that's important and things like that. But the Northumbrians were English in one sense, but they are a part of this northern British world at the same time, and they made an important contribution and worked uh, alongside the, um, uh, the Britons and the Scots and Irish in that sense. Okay. That's been a lot of names and dates. We'll have a little bit more of that afterwards, then we'll approach Wales in a slightly different way. So any questions, or shall we have a break now? It's slightly early, but it's time more or less for a, a cut-off point. No questions? Okay, let's have a break. I'll see you all in 10 minutes, something like that.